Christique Bright. And Ms. Bright, welcome. Thank you. And welcome back from uh, the, the recess, everyone. Um, Ms. Bright, did you hear the orient orientation that I gave and the introductory comments that I gave about the procedure and the um, appropriateness of focusing on rehabilitation and so forth um, that, I, that I gave earlier on? Yes, Your Honor. Um, and do you have any questions about that? No, Your Honor. Okay. And I'm going to ask you, like I have asked the other uh, petitioners, to make sure that you bring the microphone close to you and um, speak slowly when it is your time. And um, do you have any witnesses other than yourself? No, Your Honor. Any documents other than the documents that are in the petition packet? No, Your Honor. Okay. Then um, I will turn to Deputy Attorney General Summer Haro uh, to review the packet um, and um, to give some introductory comments. And just let me say that since our break, a, a quorum of the board is present. Thank you. Deputy Attorney General Summer Haro. I'm appearing on behalf of the Attorney General pursuant to Government Code Section 11522, representing the people of the state of California. I'm here to assist the panel in fact-finding. My role is not adversarial, but is intended to protect the public interest. I'm here to ensure that the panel has adequate information from which to make a decision. I would first like to mark and offer into evidence as Exhibit 1, the original petition packet with accompanying documents. The board members and petitioner have been provided with a copy of the same set of exhibits. Exhibit 1 generally consists of the cover page and a summary, a table of contents. At section A is petitioner's petition for reinstatement and supporting documents. That petition packet generally includes petitioner's petition, which is dated September 8th, 2017 has five letters of support or recommendation, which are by petitioner's supervisors and co-workers at various places of employment, including Nurse Finders, Alta Bates Summit Medical Center, California Specialty, and Vaca Valley Hospital. The packet also includes approximately 72 certificates and letters of appreciation or commendation the majority of which are from supervisors and co-workers at North Bay Healthcare. And there are also approximately six letters of appreciation from patients that petitioner cared for as a certified nursing assistant. There are also letters of appreciation from the Los Rios Community College District, Sacramento City College, Sacramento County Division of Public Health, and Hiram Johnson High School. The petition packet also includes certificates of completion of education course requirements, which includes 15 and a half courses, or course hours on ethics and courses on boundaries with patients. The petition packet also includes school transcripts from Napa Valley College, Sacramento City College, Peralto Community College District, Solano Community College, Boston Reed College, and DeVry Institute of Technology. There are performance reviews for petitioner from North Bay Healthcare dating from May 2013 through December 2016. There are also uh, competency evaluations uh, for registry staff uh, for which petitioner was one at North Bay Healthcare System. Those evaluations date from December 2008 through November 2010. There are also employee performance reviews from Alta Bates Summit Medical Center for the time periods of May 1998 through February 2000 and from February 2001 through May 2008. There are letters uh, from the United States Office of Personnel Management and the Department of Health and Human Services which terminated the Office of Personnel Management's Department of Petitioner, effective January 30th, 2008. 
There's the form DD-214, which shows petitioners honorable discharge from the Navy. There are also certifications for petitioner as a nurse assistant and as a phlebotomy technician one. There are also letters from the city and county of San Francisco's Department of Public Health. Those are all in section A. In section B, is the license certification for a psychiatric technician license number PT29784. At section C, the notice of this hearing and related correspondence. At section D is the board's March 6, 2006 decision denying petitioners petition for reinstatement at that time. At section E, is the board's August 4, 2000 decision revoking petitioner's license. At this time, I offer this packet into evidence as Exhibit 1. Exhibit 1 is marked and admitted into evidence. I'd now like to provide a brief background. On July 8, 1996, the board issued psychiatric technician license number PT29784 to petitioner. That license was to expire on November 30th, 2001. Prior to the expiration of the license on November 23rd, 1999, the board filed accusation number T954 against petitioner. The accusation alleged four grounds for discipline against petitioner for committing acts of sexual abuse, misconduct, or relations with patient, for engaging in conduct constituting incompetence, for engaging in conduct constituting gross negligence, and for engaging in unprofessional conduct. That accusation arose from petitioner's personal relationship with a patient in 1997, where petitioner engaged in telephone conversations with the patient where sexual acts were described, where patient gave the patient her home telephone number and purchased cards and gifts for the patient. On June 21st, 2000, the board adopted the proposed decision revoking petitioner's license, and on July 20, 2000, petitioner filed a petition for reconsideration, which was denied by the board on August 14, 2000. On August 14, 2000, petitioner's psychiatric li technician license was revoked, and the petitioner was ordered to pay costs in the amount of $5,000, eight, excuse me, $5,837.75. Respondent paid those costs in full on October 29, 2003. On December 30, 2005, petitioner filed a petition for reinstatement. On March 21, 2006, the board denied that petition. Petitioner is now petitioning for reinstatement of psychiatric technician license number PT29784. If that petition is granted, it must include the order must include term 24 for re-examination because of the lapse of time. I have no uh, further statements at this time, but reserve questions for petitioner. I have a question for the Deputy Attorney General. Okay, please. Just a clarifying question. Um, you referenced the honorable discharge from the Navy on page A189. Um, can you confirm that's the correct um, discharge for this, uh, for Ms. Bright? Let me find that page number. Do you have the page number reference? Yes, A189. Thank you. I just want to make sure. Um... That's correct. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And I believe I can give you the reference to where that appears. Down on the bottom in section 24, character of service is honorable. Okay. Um, Ms. Bright, this is your time to um, address the board, and um, I will ask you to stand, and I can swear you in before you testify. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Please be seated and um, address the board, bearing in mind the, um, the benefits of focusing on what you have done um, since the disciplinary action was taken. Um, as you have in your packet, a number of information dealing with my educational background 
many of which deals with um, psychology class classes, sociology classes, and various others. Um, I think that my particular issue stems from codependency. You can't hear me? Oh, okay. I think that my, um, the crux of my issues deal with, um, stem from codependency. My mother was an alcoholic, and that's something we dealt with, me and my three older sisters dealt with from the time we were young children and, until she passed away in 1991. That's not an excuse, but it gives an understanding as to why I would make a decision like that. I tended to be more sympathetic rather than empathetic. Um, so what, for me, um, it was a one-time situation. It was something that occurred and that I learned from. And I did see um, a therapist for a short period of time. Um, but most of my um, most of my um, my sorrow came from disappointing my family. Um, contrary to all of my mistakes, I was considered the person that would make it, and I was considered the person that would change the outcome of the family. And so, most of my disappointment came from disappointing my family. Um, so since that time, obviously, there's been no other incidents. I've continued to work in healthcare um, as a nurse's assistant, um, as a unit secretary. Um, I've talked to many relatives about this situation, and it was that good old-fashioned talk that's like, you know, that people do with their family members. Um, I've talked to some friends and we've um, primarily um, discussed, you know, what I did, how a situation like this occur. Um, in essence, for me, um, having to pay restitution and um, have the disappointment of my peers and my family was enough for me to um, learn from this situation. Would you like to say more before the board asks you some questions? No. Mr. Sellers. Yes, hi. Uh, good morning. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to say uh, thank you very much for your service to our country. I appreciate that. Um, question that comes to me is, so on page A7, um, page A7, uh, where it's discussing your your therapy that you may have attended or that you did attend, and it says you no longer attend, and under that you say, I quote, I get it, uh, why it's not appropriate to be with a patient. Will you explain to me why it's not appropriate to be with a patient? Um, number uh, one, it's it's not about me. It's about the patient. So contrary to whatever I may feel, my attention was to be providing the care. So that's first off. Second off, it's, um, it's the projection of what could happen. You know, the scenario could have went a thousand other ways. The scenario could have went a thousand other ways. Um, so the potential to cause harm was there. Um, the potential for other disasters, and that's from A to Z, could have occurred. So the focus should have always been about the patient and never should I have crossed those boundaries or allowed those boundaries to be crossed. Um, I, you, you have taken a lot of um, educational courses um, what, how, how can you assure us that that won't happen again? What, what, what has changed in that regard? Where, where have you uh, gained insight? What kind of support do you have currently to, to ensure that that's not going to happen again? That's pretty serious. Well, I, I work with patients and I work in intimate settings with patients. I'm a nurse's assistant. And so I 
am approached quite honestly regularly. It's not something that I've allowed to occur again. And I just, I always say too that that's inappropriate. I can't do that. I'm pretty straight up about it. And I'd say that, you know, that's against, the, you know, the rules. The hospital have policies that I now better understand um, that governs those particular issues, as well as the board and your licensure. Thank you. Mr. Deerking. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, so you petitioned for reinstatement back in 2005. Yes. And the board uh, denied that petition back in 2006. So there's we have a substantial amount of time that has elapsed since. Can you just uh, please tell us uh, some of the insights that you, you've had perhaps over the past 11 years regarding your conduct? For me, as I, you said, since that denial, since the last time, so that, that makes me want to address why I think the board declined me. I think they declined me because they may have felt that I was not being fully um, aware of the, the potential of, of what I did. I made comments like... Um, they asked me if I was sorry for what I did, and I'd say yes, um, but I did not feel like I had um, did something malicious, although now I understand that it has nothing to do with that. It has to do really with maintaining the boundaries, keeping the focus on the patient, and even though um, one may think of uh, situations in 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 those facets, and we've seen some of those types of things occur in, in other forums. Doctor marry his patient, and it's on the evening news, and it's projected as something lighthearted. But for me, I have just stood steadfast that that's not something that I can do. So, what's the difference in your? Approach, perhaps uh, you, you understand the difference between personal and professional boundaries or yes. personal and professional relationships what is the difference personal and professional professional deals with the reason why you're there the, the reason why you're there personal deals with whatever you're doing on your own personal time and and contrary to anyone that you are working with directly meaning a patient, is always considered a professional relationship. The hospital has particular um, rules about that. From the time that you've cared for someone, you are not to have relations with someone within a two-year period from that time. Okay, aside from application of or understanding of the rules, what are the dynamics associated with a professional relationship versus personal? Um, professional requires a, a particular decorum. Um, it put, requires um, a particular set of boundaries. Um, professional requires you to maintain the conduct of the role that you are working in. Um, personal is just that. It's something that's unrelated to a professional relationship. It's something that you have on your own time away from your profession and that you can, you know, engage in. Okay, so if I hear you correctly, um, the difference is that the licensee or, or the professional serves a, a patient in a professional context. Yes. And in a and anything outside a professional setting is a personal relationship. Is that right? Well, it, I I don't. There's gray areas of that, of course. Um, for example, if you are 
not just because you're at the job working, but it's still considered a professional relationship even when you're not at the job and you're dealing with someone you've cared for. But personal is separate from your career or any particular um, professional relationship that you've engaged in for whatever reason, a board hearing, uh, going to your psychologist or psychiatrist, um, it's aside from that professional setting. All right, thank you. Ms. Ms. Amazola. Um, I, can we come back to me? Thank you. Sure. Ms. Basti Martinez. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I want to just follow up on what you shared a little bit earlier and ask you a question a different way. Okay. You had asked for reinstatement before and it was denied. Yes. What makes you a different or tell us how you are different now today than you were at that time. And when I say how you are different today than you were at that time, what makes you better and more ready to be or to hold a reinstated license? Okay, thank you for that. I'm older, I'm wiser, and I'm not going to make an excuse about what occurred. It shouldn't have happened. It happened. It was wrong. And it shouldn't have happened. I think the difference is I perhaps um, gave an impression that I was not being clear that I knew that that was um, something that was completely inappropriate. Today, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna play with the gray area. I'm not it's inappropriate. I'm just not going there. The difference is I understand that those are boundaries that I should not cross, no matter what. Thank you. Now also in talking about the boundaries, etc., you quoted rules from your workplace. Um, there are other workplaces that might not have as detailed and specific rules. Tell us how you might handle a circumstance if you were in a workplace without such detailed rules. Um. Like I just stated, it's not something that I'm going to toy with. It's a it's a boundary issue now. It's just simply, it's not something I'm willing to do. It's not a boundary I'm willing to cross. It was one that's, it's a lesson for me that's already been learned. And just one other piece. You mentioned or shared with us about uh, your discovery of codependency? Yes, ma'am. Help us, in your own words, understand how that might have affected your decision making in terms of the circumstance. I think um, with codependency, especially as it relates to myself, I would, um, I would always see the good in situations and, and perhaps not see how my behavior was um, causing harm. And, and now I understand that um, codependency is equally as um, harmful as some other behaviors because it's important for you to understand how, um, how you play a role in, in, in activity, whether it was... Um, my mother alcoholism or um, 
this particular patient, I made excuses for um, for me to be involved in in doing particular things that I should not not have done. And you're present. I just want to make sure I'm hearing you right. Now, since you understand how codependency affected your life, with future patients, codependency no longer exists or affects or. Oh, I I I've. It's been twenty years since the situation. It's been seventeen since the revocation. I have had tons more of experiences of dealing with patients directly. And so through those experiences and years of experiences, I don't exhibit that anymore. That's not something that I um, allow to happen again. It's not something that I allow to, I'm able to separate work from my personal life. I'm able to um, let work stay at work. Um, so no, I'm a, I'm a total different person and my thinking and experience is a large part of that. Thank you. Ms. Endoso. No questions at this time. Ms. James Perez. Good morning. Good morning. Um, you're licensed with psychiatric technician, right? Yes, ma'am. Um, and you said earlier, um, let's back up. In uh, the very first page of your petition, you said that um, you became emotionally involved with a patient. Yes, ma'am. Um, it was, there was a sexual component too? Only talking over the phone. Only phone sex, okay. Um, and you explained why now you are aware that this is wrong. Um, and then you said it had the potential to cause harm to others. You understand that now. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in what ways could it have caused harm to others? Um, number one, as it relates to the patient, it could have, you know, it could have triggered other issues in him. It could have, um, it could have, it could have become violent. It could, um, it could make it unsafe for my coworkers. It could um, escalate to a place where um, emotionally myself or him would be more focused on each other rather than the particular issues you, we are dealing with or individually that we would be dealing with. agree with you. Um, and now you said um, this is not something you would allow to happen anymore. You would not uh, cross that boundary with someone. No. Uh, that you would you don't allow that in your life now. No, ma'am. And I'm wondering how the circumstances were different back then that you did allow that to happen. I was in my twenties, and you do some things that uh, in your twenties that you don't do when you're almost fifty. Um, and it's just a, it's life lessons. And not only that, you know, where we come from, how we were raised, our conditioning, I'm Southern. And a lot of what we call just good old Southern behavior was, is, it's, you know, in different settings can be deemed very inappropriate. Um, and it looks like uh, you have a lot of accolades from your current employer and yes, your job you're currently working as a CNA you yes, seem to be very successful in it um, does the CNA the public health board they know about the disciplinary action towards your psych tech I did not discuss that with them however on the application I never lie okay. um, so I think there was a question as it relates to uh, whether have you ever had a license revoked and I said yes okay. Um, I'm looking at page A5, and it shows that you've been, um, you've been doing some, um, it says, have you read any books or articles pertaining to professional practice? And you have. You've been looking at the DSM, and the newest version. 
And then this was interesting. Um, it says you were reading an article uh, called Great Traditions and Ethics, and it was actually on Aristotle and moral character. Yeah, this is a book, actually. A book? Yes. What did you learn from reading that? <laughs> so, um, so this is a book about some of our great, and it's been many years since I've read this book, though, but um, it's a book on our great philosophers, Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, people of that nature. Um, and in essence, it, it speaks about um, character, morality, and how that plays a part in your life. And um, essentially, it's standards by which you live by. Um, and I saw you had several reference letters, um, Ms. Washington, Ms. Cummings. Mr. Washington. Oh, I'm sorry. I did spell that wrong. <laughs> um, several reference letters. Um, there's also a Ms. Price. And the people who wrote the reference letters, one specifically, um, uh, or maybe not, Oh yeah, one uh, on 186 is the only one that uh, reports knowledge of the specific um, reason that you were your license was disciplined. Do the other uh, letter authors of the reference letters do they know about your history of discipline? All of them know. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed on page 174, it looks like you completed two semesters of an RN program. Yes, ma'am. Um, are you planning to continue that? Did you ever return? Um, I, I I did leave in good standing. Um, but I, I would like to return. And then uh, your reference letters that we referred to earlier, um, they look like all to be from 2010. Um, were there any reference letters from this year or maybe last year in the packet? I didn't see any. No, I did not. Um, I did not request any from any others. And quite honestly, for me, what happened was I had prepared a packet um, some years ago. I was trying to petition to come to the board, and I had turned in a large packet, but I think it, they were full or whatever. And um, sometimes I, you know, I have to talk my way into petitioning again or going, you know, coming before the board. So um, no, I didn't ask for any other letters. Um, and the last thing is, I noticed that you put um, many of your employment reviews, like your yearly reviews, um, in the packet. Yes, ma'am. And uh, mostly they are very good. It talks about, um, and you you have um, some awards and things like that. The only thing, and it, since it's in there, I need to address it. Um, on page A39, that's one of your most recent evals. It says interactions with coworkers has been perceived as less than respectful. Um, and her comments and facial expressions are perceived as negative by others. Um, that was on some of the more recent evals. Yes. And we know as working as a psych tech, you have to work as a team. Um, you have to have a team dynamic, especially in crisis situation, things like that. Then as I looked back, um, even as far as like 2008, 2005, 2000, um, it kept coming up that maybe the interpersonal uh, or interactions with other coworkers maybe weren't the best at times. Is that something you continue to work on or what was the circumstances surrounding that? It is something that I continue to work on. I tend to be very direct and I, um, I'm, I'm first line staff. I work with patients and I, I'm very passionate. And as it's been explained to me, I wear my emotions on my sleeve. So I'm not very good at hiding it. And um, while I have made this one mistake, I am a great um, advocate for my patients. And so sometimes I'm, I advocate hard. And if you were working as a psych tech again and you were um, on a unit and it's, it's a demanding job and can be stressful at times and one of your coworkers, um, you didn't maybe agree with something they were doing or you had a disagreement with them, how would you handle it? Um, I could say what's politically correct, but I, that's not who I am. Um, I, I'm living and breathing it right now. I don't set... Um, I don't set the ratios for caring for patients. I'm an advocate for my patients. I, 
I hope to think I haven't had an explosive situation. It's just that <laughs> I'm passionate about um, the care of the patient. And so I hope to think that I could continue to be a professional in that way. Thank you. Ms. Turner. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Right. So you're a psych, or you were a psych technician. How old were you at the time of the incident? 28. 28. Could you address vulnerabilities of an 18-year-old young man who's a schizophrenic? I know you've talked about boundaries with, a pati with patients overall or generally, mm -hmm. but as a psych tech, could you also talk about interaction and how you read the reaction of dealing with a young man in that condition? The information that I was under the impression of is that um, this individual was borderline personality. Um, and I know the difference between a borderline personality and a schizophrenic. So um, I don't want to contest information that you might have, but um, it was inappropriate for me to have done what I did or allowed what I allowed to occur. Um, my first concern should have always been about the patient. It's not something that I, I can justify. I, it was wrong. It was inappropriate and shouldn't have occurred. Um, am I touching on your question or? And so now you know, or you've learned that even if a patient may seem like, or you may think might be attracted or interested, because I don't know the circumstances in detail. Right. right. In you. Right. That as a professional, as an older person, older than the individual, that it's your obligation? It was all, it's, it's always my obligation as a professional. It's always, whether older or younger, it's always my obligation as a professional not to allow those boundaries to be crossed. I can just speak about where I'm at today. And where I'm at today is a, a life lesson. It's something I learned from. And it's not something that I've allowed to occur again. I get come on by men all the time. Patients find me attractive. Let's just be honest. And it's not something that I have allowed to occur again. That's where I'm at. Thank you for coming today. Thank you. Um, you've really answered most of the questions that I have. And I do want to commend you on your continuing education over the years. If any other questions come up, I will ask them. But thank so you. far, thank you. Thank you. I want to go back to Ms. Amazola, if you have any questions. Hi. Hi, yes. Thank you so much for coming today uh, uh, and for finding the courage to do this after 20 years. Uh, my question is, um, since it has been more than 20 years since you at this PT license, um, why do you seek reinstatement? And I read your statement, um, but given the education that you have completed, uh, what plans do you have and how does this license help you in, with those plans? Well, um, I don't think that it would be, you share the same board with the licensed vocational nursing um, licensure. So, um, this license has to be reinstated in order for me to excel higher in the medical field. Um, so what my intentions are is to have my license reinstated, perhaps get my LVN license, which I'll, 
um, educationally qualify for and continue my nursing education. Number two, I like to be able to correct a wrong. Like if you've done something that was inappropriate, you learn from it, you pay your debt to society, and you correct it and you move forward. I would like to do that so I can feel okay <laughs> with knowing that I made a mistake and I corrected it. And it serves as an example to my nieces and nephews and other family members and just people in the world. Thank you. Mr. Sellers? Yeah, I just have one um, observation and a follow-up question. For, first, for the, for the students out here, I think it's important to recognize that one lapse uh, here 20 years later, this, this young lady is still trying to correct that, that uh, bad decision. So please take that to heart. But with that, um, you've had a long time to think about this. Will you please describe to, I may have to work with you someday. Describe to me what uh, what uh, kind of psych tech you're going to be. What does your practice look like? What does my practice look like? <laughs> um, I am not sure if I understand what you mean by that. You, you must have thought over all these years, if you had the opportunity to return, what, how, what your priorities, what your uh, ethics will be, what... Uh, how you'll conduct yourself? What do, what do you? What are your aspirations in in in, in uh, returning to your practice? How how will that? Look, how, what does that look like to you? Um, I I'd like to perhaps get a job um, as a psychiatric technician and um, do patient care. I was always considered a, a great provider of care, except for <laughs> you know passionate about what I, um, my advocacy for patients, and sometimes that's it's a little um, strong. Um, but I, I would like to continue to, to share the, this, not necessarily tell them my business, but share it in terms of why I now understand how perhaps other people are potentially making a mistake or um crossing a boundary, um, that I can, I can, um, I can, I can now share through my experiences. I do share, um, I share with my nieces and nephews openly about this. Um, I continue to be a giver as I always have been. That's just a part of my nature. Um, but I can, like I tend to do with my nieces and nephews, explain the difference of these types of, um, dynamics. Thank you. Ms. Harrell. Thank you. Just a couple questions. Ms. Bright, can you tell us what it is about being a psychiatric technician that is important to you? Um, psychiatric technician work requires a, a certain understanding about mental health. Mental health. Mental health. Um, for me, I, I feel like I was a passionate um, psychiatric technician before. Uh, the difference being is I'm now able to be empathetic to the disease process and not involve myself personally with it. There was other settings that I worked in um, where I would become emotional and I'm older, I'm more experienced. And sometimes it just requires that to get you where you need to be. You're a certified nursing assistant. Yes, ma'am. How long have you had that? Since role? 2000. And I did tell the board about this situation. You talked earlier about knowing the difference between personal and professional boundaries. Yes, ma'am. In your experience as a CNA, have you had occasion to run into patients or former patients outside of a hospital setting? Oh, you do all the time because we all are all at some point in a hospital. Do you, when you run into those patients um, and have those interactions, 
Do you still consider that to be a professional relationship, even though it's outside of the hospital? Yes. You also mentioned that in your current employment, there are employer rules about boundaries and relationships with patients. Do you have any personal rules or guidelines that you follow with regards to patient boundaries? Um, I don't have, I, I, I'm reluctant to call it a rule. I just have not engaged in that way with any of the patients that I've cared for. I'm not interested. And I just, it's not something that I feel like for me is worth the, the payment. It's just not worth it for me. I don't have anything further. Do any of the board members have additional questions? One quick one. Um, when you said I, you hesitated to call it a rule, um, what's the hesitation? I'm going to tell you the hesitation. The hesitation is that we all are patients at some point. So if I, if I announce that I would never date someone that I've ever cared for, I don't think that's appropriate to say because it, it depends on the context. Um, I named some examples of how, uh, you know, people have married, not just one or two, lots of people are married to former people that they've cared for. But the context is different, meaning this. Number one, legally, you have to set the rule for you, you abide by the contractual obligation of the hospital. I can't say that 10 years from now, maybe there's someone that I'm attracted to and they're attracted to me and for whatever reason, we come together and I've not cared for that person in 10 years that I don't have a right to engage in a, a personal relationship. I work in a medical setting. I'm not looking to um, be with someone who has a mental disorder. Thank you so much. Thank you for that clarification and honesty. Any other questions from the board members? Okay. Is there anything else you would like to say at this point? I would just say, please excuse some of my comedic expressions. That's a part of my nature. I do theater as well. Thank you very much for uh, coming before us. Um, the record is closed and the matter is submitted and um, the board will make a decision and notify you of it. Thank you. At this time, we're going to go on lunch. Hour. Be back at um, twelve thirty. We'll. When we get started, we're going to go ahead and introduce ourselves again due to one of the board members joining us after we completed the first um, hearing. So again, my name is Tammy Endozo. I'm an LVN member and I'm the current board president and we'll have introductions starting on my far right. Alicia Carpenter, public member. Cheryl Turner, public member. Samantha James Perez, psychiatric technician member. Bernice Bastin Martinez, public member and vice president of the board. Paula Amazola, uh, public member. Good afternoon, John Deerking, public member. Paul Sellers, I'm a psychiatric technician member. Thank you, and we're going to turn the um, hearing over to the administrative law judge currently. Okay, welcome back, and the we will proceed. Um, with the agenda of um,
petitions and is Beatrice Lamb present? Please step forward and take a seat. Yes. And be sure and sit with a microphone close to you. You tap the microphone and make sure it's on. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you, Ms. Lamb. Have did you hear the um, the initial advisements I gave this morning about focusing on rehabilitation and the things you have done since the initial disciplinary action was taken? Right after the disciplinary action was last given, I searched for um, a rehabilitation program um, thoroughly. Well, I, I just asked you a question. Did you hear the initial advisements that I gave to um, everyone this morning before we got started? Yes, I did. Okay. Do you have any questions about that? No, I do not. Okay. And do you have any witnesses other than yourself today? No, I do not. I No, I do not. <laughs> okay. I only have me. All right. Very good. Then um, the Deputy Attorney, Deputy Attorney General Daniel McGee um, is present, and if you could please present the packet. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, again, I'm, I'm Daniel D. McGee, the Deputy Attorney General. Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Lamb. We, we met earlier this morning. Um, I'm appearing on behalf of the Attorney General and pursuant to Government Code Section 11522 representing the people of the state of California. I am here uh, to assist the panel in fact-finding. My role is not adversarial, but is intended merely to protect the public interest. I am here to ensure that the panel has adequate information from which to make a decision on your petition. And at this time, I, I would like to uh, first mark for identification and offer into evidence uh, as Exhibit 1, the original petition packet with the accompanying documents. And again, the board members have already been provided with a copy of the same set of this exhibit as has the petitioner. And Exhibit 1 generally consists of a cover page and summary of the case, a table of contents. At Section A, is petitioner's petition for reinstatement and supporting documents. And generally those consist of petitioner's petition, which is dated August 9th, 2017, and the attachments thereto, which ostensibly are various letters uh, written by the petitioner to the board. Next is a March 3rd, 2017 letter by Laura Alexander, the counselor with the Ford Street Project regarding petitioner's outpatient treatment. Also included are documents pertaining to petitioner's March 29th, 2016 arrest for Penal Code Section 647, subsection F, which is public intoxication including the Mendocino County Superior Court's minute order dated May 2nd, 2016, the Mendocino County Sheriff's pre-trial release, and the California Highway Patrol's short form regarding respondents March 29th, 2016 arrest. Next, we have an AA attendance card showing attendance at one AA meeting. There's also an August 10th, 2017 letter by Laura Alexander. Again, she's a counselor with the Ford Street Project, and this also regards petitioner's outpatient treatment. And there is also a character reference by Coraline Ken. At Section B, we have the certification for vocational nurse license number VN86031. At Section C is the notice of this hearing and related correspondence. At Section D is the board's April 24th, 2015 decision denying a prior petition for reinstatement by petitioner. And finally, at Section E 
is the board's 2011 decision denying reconsideration and the board's underlying decision revoking petitioner's license, which was effective January 23rd, 2011. And at this time, I offer this packet into evidence as Exhibit 1. Exhibit 1, the packet is marked as Exhibit 1 and admitted into evidence. Thank you, Your Honor. And now I'll provide a brief summary of petitioner's license history with the board. On September 21st, 1978, the board issued vocational nurse license number VN86031 to petitioner. The license expired on March 31st, 2012. Prior to the expiration of petitioner's license, the board, on December 9th, 2009, filed accusation number VN-2007-2663 against petitioner. The accusation alleged three causes for discipline for criminal convictions, dangerous use of alcohol, and convictions involving the use of alcohol. The gravamen of the accusation was that over a five-year period from 2004 to 2008, respond or petitioner was convicted on four separate occasions of alcohol-related offenses. Three of these convictions was for drunk and disorderly conduct, a violation of Penal Code Section 647, subsection F. One conviction was for drinking in public, a violation of Ukiah City Code Section 6000. Petitioner contested the accusation, and the matter was heard by an administrative law judge on September 16, 2010. On October 5, 2010, the administrative law judge issued her proposed decision revoking petitioner's license and ordered petitioner to pay $1,500 in costs in the event of reinstatement. The board adopted the proposed decision on December 14, 2010, and petitioner timely sought reconsideration. The board denied the petition for reconsideration on January 20, 2011, and petitioner's license was revoked effective January 23, 2011. On November 20, 2014, the board entertained a prior petition for reinstatement by petitioner. The board denied that petition with the order becoming effective on April 24, 2014. In denying the petition, the board concluded, quote, petitioner still appeared not to acknowledge that she has a problem with alcohol. She did not establish her sobriety. Petitioner provided scant evidence of rehabilitation, and end quote. Petitioner is now petitioning for reinstatement again, and significantly documents submitted in support of the petition indicate that she was once again arrested for drunk and disorderly conduct. This occurred on or about March 29, 2016. However, no charges were filed, and it appears that petitioner subsequently completed a four-month outpatient rehabilitation program through the Ford Street Project Treatment Center in Ukiah, California. And uh, it should be noted also that petitioner satisfied the $1,500 cost award imposed upon her in connection with the underlying disciplinary matter. It appears that as part and parcel of her current petition, she's requesting that that amount be reimbursed in the event reinstatement is to be denied. And finally, if reinstatement is to be granted, then due to the lapse of time, the order must include term 24 requiring the reexamination for licensure. And since the uh, burden is on the petitioner, I have no further statements and reserve the right to ask questions and turn matters over to the petitioner. Thank you. Um, my name is Miss Sam. Okay, and, um, so before you get started, let me get you sworn in yeah. so that you can testify under oath. Okay. okay. If you please stand, raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Okay. And please be seated. Thank you. And uh, you can tell us what you have to say now, okay, focusing on, okay. on, it's important that one person speak at a time. 
So um, you let me finish what I have to say, then we'll turn it over to you. <laughs> and um, I, I remind you to focus on your rehabilitation. Um, after um, you're done saying what you have to say, then the board members may ask you some questions and it will be important for you to listen to those questions and then answer those questions, okay? Thank you. Now, it's your turn to go ahead. Um, my name is Smith Lamb and um, the, the history of my license that you just heard right now was when I first started to um, go to my first hearing and what happened to me prior to that. And that was the hearing, I think, in um, West Oakland. And that was over one, two, three, four, five years ago, okay? Since that hearing of what you're hearing, I went to a board meeting in Oakland where I only had one arrest, okay? The reconsideration was for time. And I, I'm not exactly, not to be crazy, what sure either. I needed more time, papers, or, or I needed something linked together, something would be the reconsideration. And... That's the first hearing they give when you first get in trouble and they take your license in September. You know. Since then, I went to three years of AA <laughs> since that first time in September. Not satisfy the rehab requirement, but the state of California and I suffered tremendously for over a year. That would satisfy them and all these cards went in, okay? So, so, Ms. Lem, you're going to have to slow down just a little bit and stay key and and speak into the microphone. The court reporter needs to take down every word that you say, and I can tell by how quickly you're speaking that it would be very difficult for her to do so. So, I'm going to ask if you'll please slow down and okay. speak toward the microphone. So, after um, the first time they take your license in September, of what he's trying to tell you happened to me. And um, I gave um, a year of my life in AA um, to um, pay back the rehabilitation where it was not documented in the State Board of Nursing that AA was not acceptable rehab. And um, when I went to my board, board meeting in um, Oakland last year, um, I believe the AA meetings at that time were not acceptable. And they all were there. From the September 1st initial revocation, I was given a hearing, I think uh, up to three one year later, in Oakland, only just last year. So last year, I had one uh, side release. You know, um, the AAs didn't work. So I, no, sorry. Um, so my husband and I, that was mine. Okay, so um, he didn't cause that. So, and it's a bad place where I live too. And um, so, right after I was disciplined in Oakland last year, the first of it was in the September replication of which you're reading of all of my citations for life. Okay, so okay, well, so you're going to need to focus on speaking slowly and okay. clearly. Okay, my um, the September that you're talking about was when they first take your license and that's when they count up what happened to you. That's why they took it. And again, and that was in 210 or two whatever. Um, I did a year or two of um, AA and um, when I was told to go, is that good enough for you? AA, and when I was told to go to the board meeting in Oakland, I took them last year. Um, the AA were not acceptable rehab criteria, and I was given some papers from Oakland that I would do some more time and have to do better. Um, when I got my papers from the Oakland, I search diligently for a recovery program in the state of California and um, what I came up with after several of them um, was um, the Ford Street program, a patient program and I took it and went in and um, that's what I did last summer 
Then <clears throat> regarding the custody recovery program, I believe that it was due at the time of the Oakland hearing and paid diligently. So we need to slow down again, speak Sorry. clearly. The cost recovery I gave willingly at the Oakland hearing and believed that I had to pay it then. I didn't know. And um had to suffer for that. When I didn't know we didn't didn't pay it when we did got it back. So they've got that. And whatever. So um I'll take a break. And I went to my recovery pro program. Um it did me some good. Um I seemed to care for it and go on. Um and since then, all these arrests have deteriorated since his September initial revocation of problems that I had with it. That was the worst with September. The Oakland was only one, sir. And the recent one um, that I got, so I did my recovery program slowly this summer. And, um, well, I went to uh, see my friend, and um, he was dying of cancer, and um, some papers came out. And I didn't know uh, if the time would be one to three to four days, slowly. So we were up in a camp, and uh, there was alcohol around. And I had a beer, and I uh, got a sight and release from here, not a court date. And um, so I, um, again, um, didn't say no nothing. I'd like to break, you know. You didn't go right away to file for your nursing licenses or anything. I talked to um, the enforcement unit. A lady called that was in there, and she said, you should go ahead and try anyway and try for your reinstatement, even though you had a side of release here, and try anyway, and I did. And um, I filled out some hearing papers this summer. Last summer I went to recovery. Well, actually, no. This last winter, I went to recovery. This summer, I worked on my nursing papers, but I searched diligently from Oakland. The only time that I had those convictions that you're talking about when they initially took my license that I applied for in September were way before the license hearing. Those convictions were way before I ever filed for a nursing hearing. I could have been in a door in a box, but they didn't have work. After the nursing hearing, they were prior to your hearings. So, um, Ms. Ms. Lamb, I'm going to ask you to refocus a bit on what you have done for purposes of rehabilitation. You've been describing some proceedings and so forth, but well, the, the board needs to hear what you have done for purposes of rehabilitation. Okay, so focus on that. I have just finished my program last winter. Um, I hear you say that again. I just finished my recovery program this last winter, which was about, I think I came out in April or May, I'm not really sure. And um, since then, I try to go to AA, but I have had some problems filling out nursing papers here due to someone wanting me to come anyway and try hard. And... Um, so now what I'm doing is going back into another program. I'm going into two programs, actually. I'm planning on going on to two more recovery programs. And I'm get the husband got rid, he's, he's been taken away so that he can't cause me any further problems with this drinking up there. And uh, so I should be okay. I also need to change area. Okay, is there anything else you would like to say about your recovery at this point? Yes, I would. I'd like to say that, um, um, truthfully, those arrests were prior to the first nursing hearing in September when my license was revoked. The only two you got me on after it was revoked when you took it away for what I'd done in the past was the one in Oakland and uh, the one that I've got here, which is also only a site and release. And I think that's true. I plan on continuing my recovery. Um, very much I uh, don't have him anymore I'm not saying he's a bad person he just can't be around me because he likes to throw cancer patients and papers and do things to me that doesn't exist and they've taken him away so I'm on my own and I'm happy about it and um, so um, I'm planning on going to two more recovery programs I do understand that someone wanted me to try to come here to get to get uh, to 
to try to get my license back anyway, since I've only had two arrests, one in Oakland and one here. Those were prior to the first initial revocation. I could have gotten those before I was even a nurse or whatever. I mean, I'm not a nurse, but, you know, before I applied for a hearing, so that's not fair. It's not like I got all those and then went to Oakland and here. That's not right. So that's all I really have to say. And do you have any questions for me? Mr. Sellers. Yes, hi. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good afternoon. Um, do, uh, do you currently have a sobriety date? Okay. Um, I've been asked that before, and um, I'm not going to lie to you. And I think my sobriety date would be in my recovery program here at this time. So what is that date? Well, we're going to say the day we started, and I believe that was either, I can't say for sure. If you want to help me look, well, I'll look, look here. I'll look here, not you, but me. Probably November or something, and I plan to go to more. I kind of like them, and um, they don't cost that much. You, do you currently attend AA meetings or any kind of recovery, AA or NA? Just recently got one in, but then I've had to do nursing papers all summer here, so I've been filling out papers for her and unable to attend much. But do do go, do care for it. Okay, thank you. I don't just, I'm not a drinker. I had problems with people in bad circumstances. The ones prior to that, I had problems, is not at that when I applied, they took it right there, and then I had one and one. I'm pretty good, huh? <laughs> okay. Yep. And no, um, so, Mr. Deer King, do you have any questions? I have no questions, Your Honor. Okay, I would like to give you my sobriety date. And I haven't been able to do the paperwork of the nursing board. This is only a site and release and one in Oakland. And then prior to September is what they got me on for the ones that I had when they pulled my license from not being able to get along well there. I have no psychological problems. I'm a good person. Um, the man is gone. And I'm not trying to put that on you, but to let you know, that's been changed. And I'm happy about the change. And I, I, I like to think I'm a good nurse, and I really do care for people. I help people. So, um, so at this point, we're, family. At this point, we're asking you to respond to questions. Yes, you, You've had your opportunity to I, make your statement. And um, Mr. Sellers had asked you for a sobriety date, and it sounded like you were looking for one. Do you have a sobriety date? Yes, I do. Can My you tell sobriety us that? date, sir, was two seven seventeen. This is the day, and this is what I cared about was my recovery program. I'm also planning on attending. Can I talk two more? Okay, and so you get the sobriety date of two seven seventeen based on a certificate of some sort. Yes. And what is that a certificate of? The certificate of a recovery program where I. Went through for my life, which I care about, which works for me. Thank you. I'm not a drunk. I'm a person that phoned in bad circumstances. I didn't come here to ask you for my license back for what I've done in the last side and release. I came here to ask you for help so that I can go through my recovery curves and somehow get my life back. But a lady I, who is like you, I guess, I don't know, excuse me. Um, has told me to go on and try, and that that's what worked for me. Thank okay. you. So another member, other members are going to have the opportunity to ask you questions now. So if you listen to the questions and answer the question that's presented, okay? Oh, yeah. And uh, Mr. Deer King, no questions? No questions. Let me tell you. Is Amazola? Hi, uh, yes. Um, uh, I understand that this is a, a, a very... Um, Maybe uh, you're nervous, uh, and I, I guess I would like to know when was the last time you had an alcoholic beverage? From your I'm gonna recollection, say this recovery date for you that I oh, care about so much. Well, I must have. I don't know. That was the site release. Um, I'm gonna say the recovery date, November seventh, um, two thousand seventeen. I haven't had much time to myself as I've been filling out papers for everybody for nursing. So my question was, from your recollection, when was the last alcoholic beverage you had? I'm going to say the date on my recovery program, and I'm respecting him at 11, I believe, 7 to 17. Thank you. Yes, I'm vibing off or busy. I do care.
Is Baste Martinez? Yes. Good afternoon. Um, you've told us repeatedly that you're here to get help. Um, I'm confused. What do you mean by that? I'm not here to get help. I said uh, the lady that um, I talked to to get my papers from, ma'am, said that I should go ahead and try for reinstatement, even though I didn't, I, she even told me, go ahead, even though there's a sign and release that you have a recovery program and that you should go ahead. If I'm hearing you correctly, you said someone else told you to go ahead. Yeah. You believe you're ready to go ahead. And serve in a role as a licensed vocational nurse. I believe that I didn't look back from the side and release and um, while the recovery program well the recovery program to the recovery program so I did right. I believe that I'm ready to go but would like to go ahead and do some recovery programs. Thank you. I'm really getting into them. <laughs> Ms. Endoso? No questions at this time. Ms. James Perez. Good afternoon, Ms. Lamb. Good afternoon. How are you? Are you currently working now? No, I'm not working. And I, I currently just completed a recovery program and last winter. And um, I think I had to go to the board the night, year before again, Ma'am, I understand you were questioning me, and um, prior and um, and so that didn't count. And then um, this one I had papers for. That's all I know. Okay. I would like to work. I haven't made it that far. Would you like to work as a nurse again? Yes. <laughs> kind of Did determined. You ready yes, to? I have last just lost my husband. So yes. You think you're ready to go back on a unit? And oh yeah. Work as yeah, a nurse? I think I'm very smart. Yeah. Um. I think I'm not the best person, maybe look down, but I think I'm smart. Sure. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not the best person at all, sure. but I'm, I, you know, I'm intelligent at least. Right. You know? <laughs> so you, the program that you went to, it was four months. It looks like to me from the packet that you entered the rehab program in October 2016. Yeah. And you left, you graduated from the program oh. 2 7 -17. That was the day you graduated from the well, program. Well, then it's 11 um, October 11th, 2017, it'd be the sobriety date. I'm showing a two, um, I'm, so the end of, the end date of your program was 2717. Yeah, Excuse me, ma'am. What I'm showing is a 2717, um, I started my program, um, in November, I believe, October, October, November of the year, and 16, October, November of 16. October I, 11, 2016. Yes, ma'am, I haven't had much time to myself. And um, uh, two, um, 717 is when I graduated. It's right here. That's your graduation Yes, ma'am, you can call um, And when you were in that program, you weren't drinking alcohol during that program. No, I'm very happy. Okay. Yeah. Now, that program that you went to, did the court tell you you had to go to that program? Or you went on your own voluntarily? I went on my own voluntarily. Okay. so Because when, I didn't under, understand at the time before I had my license revoked to go back to my Oakland hearing that AA didn't work here. And then, um, as you stated, you don't attend Alcoholics Anonymous anymore. Yes, I do attend Alcoholics Anonymous. I have not had time to attend very many here. Um, I mean, where I live, not here where I live because um, I've been having to put these papers through pretty quickly right now. And the, the paper, the nurse, the papers for your yeah. the nursing, yeah. it took up all your time? Pretty much. Yeah. Okay. And then the AA, yeah. And so how many, just say in the last month, how many AA meetings have you gone to? I've only, well, I might have went to two or three, but only I've had to sign for one. Okay. I've also rechecked to try to find another program, but I had, I don't know. 
Do you have a sponsor that you work with? No, but I will have soon. Well, actually, the programs that I'm going to go to, um, I don't think they require a sponsor. What she does is write a paper stating that they do have, and you'll see the paper here, where she didn't ask for the sponsor at the time. Okay. And that she there's several papers where she didn't need a sponsor. She okay. doesn't need one. You'll see the paper where she states, we do not need a sponsor. Okay. The AA documents, all through the program, I went to AA. And I, there should be a record in here of Laura where she has put, I went to AA three times a week for four months, and I didn't need a sponsor. Yes, I did AA for four months. Okay. That was when you were in the program. They don't give a sponsor. She's Now, yeah. at your previous okay. reinstatement hearing, when you came before the board before, uh, we denied you having your license back. And in the decision, it says that you did not acknowledge that you have a problem with alcohol. Do you think you have a problem with alcohol, Ms. Lamb? Well, I think I'm correcting it. Would you consider yourself an alcoholic? No, I would not. I would consider myself a binge drinker. Binge drinker? A binge drinker is what I was, like that. And then my last question is, I noticed two times in the packet, you're stating you want the board to give you back $1,500. No, I don't want the board to give me back anything because um, they told me that $1,500 I accidentally paid early and I didn't know, but I can't get it back because um, I've already paid it and um. And so those if I ever get it back, which I hope I do because I'm getting tired, uh, then I should go ahead and leave it there. So you, you would like to be reimbursed the money? No, I would not. I, I mean, I well, I don't know if I'm not going to get my license back. I mean, I could go ahead and reimburse, but then if I got it back, I would have to pay it. So I would just like to leave it there. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome, Madam Cups. Ms. Turner. Thank you. And for... The Ford Service uh, Counseling Center twice? Pardon me? Pardon me? Yes. Did you attend Ford Street Counseling twice? No, I attended uh, Ford Street Counseling um, with AAs four times a week once. Okay, because I saw a notation, and um, it's not in your writing, but it said that you stopped at some point because you were tired of doing it all. No, I completed my program very happily. And you mentioned your husband. Um, what impact did your husband have on you, on you or your binge drinking with alcohol? Yeah. Uh, my ex-husband uh, was very bad about it, and the people are not too good. So, But uh, since he's been left, it, that's not really it. But I'm glad, it, it's very painful um, to watch him leave, but I'm a better person. Thank you. Thank you. I respect. Do you have any more questions? Okay. I have no questions. Oh, there are some more questions. Uh, Ms. Carpenter. No, I have no questions. And Mr. McGee, do you have questions? Uh, yes, thank you, Ms. Lamb. Have you ever asked anybody to sponsor you? My only um, answer for that is that um, in this particular program, and you'll notice the papers in there, I hope that you find them, that you do, she states she doesn't need a sponsor. Somewhere in this letters, in here, she, what she told me, it should be written, that we did AA four times a week and I didn't need a sponsor. I asked her to write that down, that we didn't need a sponsor, and she said she would. It should be in the paperwork. If you can't find it, that is what Laura Alexander said. Thank you. Have you ever worked the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous? Yes, I have written the 12 steps of the Alcoholics Anonymous, and I um, understand. It's been quite a while through all the paperwork and recovery program. Just it's just an AA. You said that you were a binge drinker. Is that correct? Yes. If you have the urge to drink today after leaving, do you have a plan in place? Um, what are you going to do to resist yeah. that urge? Excuse me, sir. And um, what I'm going to do to ex ex stop that urge is to slow down. Think clearly, deal with different people, don't go back to the same people, can try to do better in life. And the man that I uh, have counseling with is also doing my housing for me now, it'll be only me, and try to do better. 
I have no further questions, Your Honor. Do any of the other members have additional questions? Thank you very much for your time. The matter is uh, submitted, and we are off the record. The record's closed. I'm looking forward to going to some more recovery programs, and I hope I make it. It's not that I'm not trying to make it. I really am. It's not that I have too much of a problem. It's that I needed help with my husband, but you said no help. So I helped my, myself. Thank you. Okay. The... Um, Next, oh, and so exhibit one is, it, yeah, we're back on the record. Exhibit one is admitted, and I'll give that to you, Mr. McKee. Thank and you. And the next um, matter is Ido um, Lawrence, it's Mr. Lawrence, Ms. Lawrence. Good afternoon, Ms. Lawrence. Uh, did you hear the advisements that I earlier gave to um, the petitioners as a whole that um, it would be best to focus on rehabilitation and what steps you have taken since the initial disciplinary action? Do you have any question about that? Okay. Um, it looks as though you have some additional paperwork um, that are, are, are those items that you would like the board to see? Okay, and um, do you have copies for each uh, member of the board? Thank you. And Mr. McGee, will you help distribute those, please? I will, thank you. Thank you. Okay, the paperwork that has been distributed um, consists of a letter signed by Yemi Lawrence and a handler performance development discussion. Um, I'm going to mark the letter as Exhibit 2 for identification and the Handler Performance Development Discussion as Exhibit 3 for identification.
So, uh, Mr. McGee, would you like to uh, introduce this matter, please? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. And again, I'm, I'm Daniel McGee, Deputy Attorney General, and I'm appearing on behalf of the Attorney General, pursuant to Government Code Section 11522, representing the people of the state of California. I'm here to assist the panel in fact, finally only. My role is not adversarial, but is intended to protect the public interest. I am here to help that the panel has adequate information from which to make a decision. And at this time, Your Honor, I would like to first mark for identification and offer into evidence Exhibit 1, which is the original petition packet and its accompanying documents. Again, the board members have already been provided with a copy of the same set of this exhibit, as has the petitioner. And Exhibit 1 in this instance generally consists of the cover page and summary of this matter, a table of contents at Section A is the petitioner's petition for reinstatement, and supporting documents, and those generally consist of a uh, petitioner's petition dated May 22nd, 2017, the attachments thereto, uh, continuing education certificates showing some 14 hours obtained in year 2017. There's also a State Center Community College District student academic record dated February 7th, 2017, and an April 26th, 2017 letter of recommendation by FedEx Supervisor Kenneth Roberts. At Section B is the Certification for Vocational Nurse License number VN241397 at section c is the notice of this hearing and related correspondence at section d is the board's december 13th 2013 decision denying reconsideration and the board's underlying decision revoking the petitioner's license and that was effective december 16th 2013 and at this time i, I do offer this packet into evidence as exhibit one Exhibit one is admitted into evidence. Thank you, Your Honor. Now as to a uh, background for this matter, on April 16th, 2009, the board issued vocational nurse license number VN241397 to petitioner. The license expired on January 31st, 2015. Prior to the expiration of petitioner's license, the board, on June 12, 2012, filed accusation number VN-2010-637 against the petitioner. The accusation alleged four causes for discipline against petitioner for gross negligence, incompetence, false entries in hospital patient records, and dishonest acts. The gravamen of the accusation was that petitioner, during her first position as a vocational nurse with the Mule Creek State Prison, administered the wrong dose of insulin to a patient under her care by administering the prescribed PM dose when she should have administered the prescribed AM dose. Instead of documenting the medication error and notifying the patient, or any treating physician or supervisor, respondent willfully charted that she had given the correct dose. Petitioner contested the accusation and the matter was heard by an administrative law judge on June 24, 2013. At the time of hearing, petitioner stipulated to the underlying charging allegations and contested only the type of discipline to be imposed. On July 24, 2013, the administrative law judge issued his proposed decision revoking petitioner's license and ordered petitioner to pay $9,866 in costs. In so doing, the administrative law judge found that the admitted causes for discipline were serious and that respondent's subsequent dishonest acts in attempting to conceal her serious mistake provided an example of the adage that the attempted cover-up is always far worse than the initial crime. The board adopted the proposed decision on December 6, 
2013, and petitioner timely sought reconsideration. The board ultimately denied the petition for reconsideration on January 20th, 2011, and petitioner's license was revoked effective December 16th, 2013. Petitioner is now petitioning for reinstatement. In this regard, it may be noted that a balance of $7,526 remains outstanding on the $9,866 cost award. And also, if reinstated is to be granted, then due to the lapse in time, the order must include Term 24 requiring reexamination for licensure. And because the burden is on petitioner, I have no further statements, but reserve the right to question petitioner. Thank you, Mr. McKee. Um, Ms. Lawrence, do you have any witnesses other than yourself that you're going to wish to call today? Okay. Uh, would you please stand and raise your right hand so I can swear you in? We solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Okay. Please be seated and um, tell the board members uh, what you have to say, bearing in mind that you should focus on what you have done toward rehabilitation since the initial discipline was imposed. And I remind you also to lean forward and speak into the microphone. Thank you. My name, first name is Sidhu, last name is Lawrence. So the, I, the court reporter can't hear you, so you're going to need to lean much more forward and speak right up against the microphone and speak um, slowly because uh, when people are nervous, they tend to speed up. My name, first name is I D O W U, last name is Lawrence, L A W R E N C E. Thank you. Uh, for giving me this opportunity. You, can you keep your voice up, please? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I want to thank God for giving me the opportunity today to be able to address the issue of my license that I've been reporting for more than three years. Uh, I have no excuse. I'm responsible for what I did. I learned for a mistake, for my mistake. I did not uh, allow the experience to hold me back. Rather, I decided to come here this afternoon. Any error, any mistake in life is meant for someone to learn and hold from it. I learned my lesson for a good three years that I lost my lessons. I went ahead to go on to attend a class for my, I graduated from a Fresno City College. I'm unable to take my License exam because of the appreciation against my avian license. Does this incident happen? I learned my lesson. I'm grown as a person and as a nurse. Like I said, I have no excuse. I'm responsible for the action that I took at that time. But now, I know the implication. I know the importance of this right of medication. I know the importance of <coughs> professionalism and honesty. I know the importance of beauty transparency. I trust among the co-workers. Currently, I have a rule.
for learn and taking continual education. Presently at my work, current work, I consider this soon the ethic and professionalism. I'm asking board to consider my petition so that I can have my lessons back. Is there more you would like to say before the board members ask questions of you? For now. Mr. Sellers? Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Lawrence. I understand this can be difficult. And um, I, I, first I want to say, um, I, I have, I'm, I, we're not here to question whether you're a good person. I, I, don't, I don't doubt that you're a good person. My, my concern and our concern is that you made a serious error a few years back and we want to understand that error and make sure you understand what happened and see if in fact you're you're capable of practicing again that's all we're after here you you characterized in your statement uh, the reason why you lost your license as um, you gave an incorrect dose of insulin yes and you said that you you didn't complete a medication error within 24 hours is that the nature of the error you made Excuse me, sir. Can you repeat that? I don't understand that. Um, what was the error more than failing to document it in a in a, in a, in a to, to to enter a medication error? It, let me rephrase it directly. Um, wasn't the issue that you you hid the fact that the men that you had administered an incorrect dosage? Is that the reason why you were your your license was revoked? Uh, I think the uh, uh, Mr. Incorrect dose of insulin. Sorry. I said administer incorrect dose of insulin right. and fail to uh, complete um, medication. Can error. you speak into the microphone, please? Yeah. Yeah. And fail to uh, complete. Um, Medication error report. You, you, you. Why, why would it be? What was the problem with the medic with giving the wrong dosage? What, what, what might be the results of giving the wrong dosage of of, of insulin to a patient? It can put the life of the patient into danger. Danger. I said it can put the life of the patient into danger. It could, it could, it could in fact. Uh, that, do you understand that the reason why that, that it is important that you had made the right notifications immediately was that that patient's life was in danger at that moment, the 24 hour time of the, of the, of the medication error report wasn't the concern. The concern was that the patient's life was placed in danger. You under, do you understand that? Yes. I have no further questions at this point. Mr. Deer King. I have no questions, Your Honor. Ms. Amazola? Can we come back to me, please? Yes. Ms. Baste Martinez. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I want to make sure I hear you, too. So, just like this, talk to me yeah. when I... Okay. You mentioned um, that part of the circumstance was not completing or reporting the error or completing the error report. Yes. 
is can you help us understand why you did not complete that report? At that time, I, I, like I said, it's not an excuse for me. Um, that's my, I know as a, as a new nurse, I was working alone in ASEG. Where two nurses supposed to be there? I was in loop. It was busy. Like I said, it's not an excuse for me. I respond for the for the action that I took. Take a minute. That's fine. I said, at that time, the incident happened. I was a new nurse. I'm novice. Where two nurses supposed to work that that day, I was the only one that worked on that unit. I said, like I said, it's not an excuse to me. You mentioned you were a very new nurse. Nervous, nervous. A nervous nervous. nurse. What does, help me understand what you mean when you say a nervous. Nervous is when when you are new. She's saying novice, I believe. Novice. Okay, I'm sorry. I heard the wrong thing. My apologies. How long... Had you been licensed at that time? Oh, I thought I got my license um, April 2009. Mm -hmm. And this day, I think this said will happen 2010 August, if I didn't make a mistake. What kind of assistance or backup did you have working in that setting? Was there a supervisor or someone you could seek assistance from? And how did that work? Like I said, uh, at that time I worked for agency. I'm not employed by, uh, by the prison, um, Ion Prison, Molik. I was sent there through the agency. And so there was, if you needed help or you had questions or anything, there was no one to call or? Mm. Like I said, I see where you are, I'm new. Mm -hmm. That's why I said I learned my lesson. Now, if I want to apply for a job, I know the type of question I will ask. I will know what to ask. I will know what I need at that time. I will tell you sincerely from my heart, I didn't know their numbers to call. I have a different question now. If you were to be granted an opportunity to practice again, what's your plan? Why do you want to have your license reinstated? How will you use it? Mm. Uh, if my license can be reinstated, I will pay a detail. I will pay uh, attention to detail. Why do you want your license back? Are you going to practice? Are you going to go on to school? You, you've written some things in your statement. I just want to put it all in perspective. Yeah. Um, 
why I want my last test, I want a boy to give me the check on chance so that I'll be able to practice, to continue helping to contribute to my community. This is what I love to do. I will be able to help those who I need. That is has been always my motivation to be in this field. I know I made a, a I can say a silly mistake which it will never never happen to me again. Thank you. Ms. Endosa. So I have a question in regards to um, at the institution, you were registry, correct? Yeah, when you worked at the institution, you were registry, not the state. Yes. So did they only provide you the 40 hours of orientation in a classroom setting, or did they also put you one-on-one -on -one with other nursing staff who are seasoned and have worked in those units? Uh, when we started the orientation, they, they allowed to work with the nurses that they are there before. They spare with the old nurses that have been working there before. Okay. And when the incident happened, were you still on orientation or were you set to go work the unit by yourself? I was set to work by myself. And in the unit, is there more than one nurse in the unit at that time? Yes. And if you had questions, were you able to ask that nurse? No, they are, I think they are in other um, units. Before I can go to them, I had to make a call. I said, can you repeat the question so... So since you were working on your own already, yes, is there more than one nurse in that unit where you were working? Yes. So you had a partner that you could ask? No, I didn't have. That day I was working alone. So they had intended you to work alone in that unit where normally there's two? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Ms. James Perez. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. I know it's it's a little difficult for you. Um, so the insulin order was 15 units of Lantus, but instead you gave 40 units of Lantus, correct? Yes. Now the standard procedure for giving insulin is that once you draw up the uh, insulin, a second nurse has to initial the dosage. Like I said, that is why I say I learned my lesson. So who signed with you to say that was in, the correct in, dosage? Uh, in that area, you had to do it alone. In that facility. So there was no second nurse initialing no. the dose for you? That is why I said I learned my lesson. Did you learn in school that the proper way to administer insulin is to have two signatures? When I went back to my RN, when we they separated it, Assigned not to clinical orientation. You have to be two nurses to witness the issue. Absolutely. Before you, before you go give. <laughs> two nurses are to read the order together. After you draw the insulin, you have to sway to the second nurse. Second nurse, right? You have to go sign with you. So no one signed with you that day. Okay. And then to make it worse, there was an effort to cover up what had happened, right? I don't mean to cover up. So in the in the judge's decision previously, it said um, that you charted um, that you gave the 15 units. And then during the evening shift change, you told another LVN to only give 15 units of Lance Lance. Lantus, I'm sorry, to the inmate that evening because you had already given the 40 dose in the morning. So you asked the other nurse to give less because to to offset the mistake? Yes, please. 
And so that's also part of it, right? Is can you see that that was also wrong? That was part of covering up, try to cover up the mistake? Discover. Now, I read something in here. You went to a, you went through or did you graduate from a registered nurse program? Yes, please. Yeah, in 2013, 13. you graduated from Fresno City College Nur Associate Degree Nursing Program. Yes. And then you became eligible to sit for your RN boards. It didn't allow me to take the test. I see. So the RN board told you you cannot take the exam yeah. when oh, you yes. applied yeah. because of your the problems with your LVN license. Yes. If your LVN license were to get reinstated, would you then also be able to take the registered nurse boards? I, I think I had to clear the, my LVN license first before I... I I said I had to get my um, LVN license clear from my position before I can apply for right. RU. But then do you plan to, if you, if you were, your LVN license were to be reinstated, would you then uh, petition the Board of Registered Nursing to take your exam? No, according to here, they say if my license is reinstated, it's hard to be under probation. I don't, I don't think I can go right away to go and take the exam for the RWA. Is that something you would like to do in your future? Yeah, I would. Yeah. Um, on page A14, you wrote, um, this era of my life has provided me an opportunity to grow as a person and as a nurse. Um, in what ways have you grown personally? Um, and that would make you a better nurse. Yeah, like I said, as I learned the importance of professionalism and honesty at work, even at home, at work. And the important build me uh, the importance of building transparency, transparency and honest among the coworkers. I see the importance of build transparency among workers. Thank you. Ms. Turner. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm a public member, so could you help me understand how you confused 15 units and 40 units of Lantus? Um, did you not understand the doctor's orders? Um, were you unable to read you know, the hypodermic or whatever it was you used to inject? Um, like I said, it's not an excuse. I'm not making an excuse. Um, the order was listening together. Order. The order, the medication order yes. was written together, both AM and PM. Together, yeah, and by the, by the time I realized it was PM dose, PM, PM dose. All right, and so you didn't report, but that was in the past. Whose responsibility is it to report? A medication error. I'm the one. And what in what time period are you supposed to report a medication error? Immediately. Ms. Carpenter. I have no questions. Ms. Amazola, any questions? Um, thank you so much for coming today and um, I have a question with regards um, hypothetically if you were to be given your license back 
would you seek employment with an agency or with this uh, institution again? And if, if yes or no, why? Uh, I will never work with agency. Why? Uh, because I learned my lesson. Can you tell us in what ways you learned your lesson? Yeah, um, I hope is if I was employed through the 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 facility itself. I said, if I was employed by the facility itself, not through agency. Um, I don't know. I, I guess let me clarify a little bit. Um, would you say that working for uh, an agency gave you enough preparation to do your job in this type of facility and provided the support no thank you um i read in your case in the past that you said um that you testify i wish the doctor or supervisor would have notified me that this incident would have required filling out an incident report um, it sounds from previously that you've now rectified this lack of knowledge. Yeah. It also states here, um, that you notified the doctor, um, says she alleged that she notified the doctor, explained what had happened and under doctor's orders, monitor the patient every 15 minutes. Yes, I, I called the doctor, but as you know, even though you do it, you didn't document, that's me, you don't do it. Okay. And he, the person that you talked to, did he advise you to do a report? Yeah, but when he gave me order, I supposed to, to write it in a, a medication error, and inform my supervisor and fax the uh, medication error to the pharmacist. Let me clarify this. So you did write a medication error to the pharmacist? No, I said, as you know, it, normally I'm supposed to do the medication error and notify my doctor. I notify my supervisor and fax the the paper to the pharmacist to inform them that there is an error. So, so okay, so you informed the pharmacy there was an error. I said I supposed to. You're supposed to, to but you did not. No, I did not. Did when you talked to the doctor, did he tell you to do that? Yes. And you chose not to. I, I'm not choose not to. You know, mistake. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how can I explain. It, it mistake sometimes. Like I said, it's it's meant for us to to learn something valuable. To learn something valuable, mistakes sometimes. Okay, so I just want to understand if I the the what happened. So there was a mistake, you talked to the doctor, the doctor said fill out a report, you were understaffed, there was no support, you were attending 100 patients, you didn't, did you not have the time, did you? I, I think I forgot, I forgot to, to do You it. forgot to, okay. And that, like I said, that's not an excuse for me. Well, I, I, I just want to understand the, the case and the circumstance. Thank you so much for helping me understand it. So given the situation with the lack of support, 
and the 100 patients you were in charge of, you forgot to do the report. Thank you. Do any of the other board members have questions at this point before Mr. McGee asks? Questions? I do, just a couple follow up. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Ms. Lawrence, thank you for being here. With regards to the uh, training that you have when you were originally assigned there at the state prison facility, that was initially a combination of classroom and then a mentorship, right? Where you worked one on one with a, a senior nurse? I think so. Okay. In addition to that, there were opportunities to do some learning in all the different areas of the facility. Is that right? Can you repeat that, please? You went, you went throughout the facility and learned about the different units. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, In the previous decision, there, were, there was a reference that you, in addition to that training, you received further help and instruction because there were certain complaints brought to a supervisor. Is that right? Do you recall that? I can't recall that. Okay. Do you know that if there was an allegation that you were a safety concern in the prison setting? Does that sound familiar? No. Okay. Do you know if you were organized or disorganized as you conducted your daily duties there? I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. Today, let me ask this. Today as we speak, do you feel like you had the right skill set in nursing for a prison setting? Yes. Okay, and then you recall uh, an interview with a board investigator? Yes. Okay, in the decision, the administrative law judge noted that during the interview, you were defensive, argumentative, agitated, and upset. Is that correct? I don't think so. Um, whether it's a... Uh, uh Communication barrier, I don't know. Well, that would be the substance of the discussion with the investigator, right? The medication error. I'm talking about the investigation itself. You recall speaking to a board investigator? Yeah. And how would you characterize that investigation? I don't know. Okay. Um, did you use car keys as a pointing device towards well, the investigator uh, or make any assertive or aggressive gestures? At that time of the investiga uh, investigating, I was with my two years old son. Uh, that is trying to grab the key from me. I'm not using key as a point of a something. Oh, okay, so the investigator tried to grab a key from you? I say I was with my two years old son with Why me. So? He was with me at that time. He tried to grab the key from me and I don't want to give it to him. Oh, I see. I'm not, I will never, never use key as a point of of it. All right, thank you. So I just want to clarify. So on the medication sheet, when you're to give the medication, how is it written? Are there multiple doses in one box? So if it, does it read give AM dose of 15 units Lantus and PM dose 40 units of Lantus. 
in one box or are they two separate boxes? I think it's two se separate, it's the same sheet, but two separate lines. Two separate lines, Fine. but the wording is in one box on the medication administration sheet. Yes. So it possibly could have been that when you read that, because you're fairly new to the institution, most other hospitals and most other facilities, they have them separate. Yes, AM separate, PM separate. And when you went to school, that's how they presented the MAR normally, correct? Yes. yes. So when you went there, although you were new, when they oriented you, did they explain that this is how the MAR goes? And when you had your one-on-one -on -one training, did the staff allow you to pass meds with them overseeing you, or did they just pass the meds while telling you the procedure of how to pass the medication when they're orienting. Sometimes they allow me, but not all the time. Okay, thank you. Any other questions by board members? Mr. McGee. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Ms. Lawrence, along the same lines as the questions that Mr. Deerking was asking you, um, first, it seems to me you would agree that uh, the underlying causes for discipline that were brought against you they were they were pretty serious right yes. okay so in my read of the underlying decision by which your license was revoked um the administrative law judge and you can either disagree or agree with this but the administrative law judge found that you attempted to cover up the medication error first during your job. Do, do you disagree with that? At this time, I, I cannot disagree. We, we, we didn't hear you, ma'am. I said at, at this time, I, I cannot disagree. I responsible for what, what happened. I responsible for it, for the action that I took. I cannot lie. It is not an excuse for me. I'm here and asking board to give me check on chance so I can prove myself that I'm a good nurse. I do care for my patient. Uh, oh, okay, and going back to the same underlying decision by which your license was revoked, the administrative law judge also went on to suggest that your attempt to cover up your actions, they continued through the investigation itself that was conducted by the board. Um, do you disagree with that? Or do you admit to these circumstances? Please, can you give me an example? You, you admit? Can you give me the example? I, I can't really understand very well the question. Okay. I said I don't really understand the question clearly. Okay, uh, I'm, I guess I'm just trying to simply to either get you to acknowledge or to disagree with um, the finding that you attempted to conceal your actions with the medication error that occurred. I say I'm responsible for the action I took. I have no excuse. I made that kind of error. I don't mean to harm my, my patients. I learned my lesson from this incident. Okay, so if reinstatement is to be granted and you're to get your vocational nurse license back, how can the board feel comfortable that you won't engage in light conduct in the future? No, I know the importance of this right of medication. I know the importance of build professional and honest among co-workers. I know the importance of safety precaution. 
and know the importance of pay duty to pay attention to duty. Know the importance of professionalism. Follow the correct procedure and honest correctly a place of my job as consistently showing the ethics and professionalism. And I've gained the trust of my supervisors. Presently we are working. I've gained the trust of my supervisor and my co-workers. <laughs> through, <laughs> through my dedication and commitment to my job. Is that it? Uh, just just a couple more questions on on page a14 um, of your petition you uh, indicate um, that you still possess a passion for serving your community and providing health care let, let me ask what, what what have you been doing in terms of community service since the date your license has been revoked yeah uh, in my church, I am among of the close, uh, food closet group. I said in my church, our church, I was among the um, closet group, food closet. We call it food closet. Every uh, two weeks, we provide food for those who are in need. We serve them. And one last question, ma'am. Um, since the date of your license being revoked until today, have you been convicted of any crimes of which we're unaware? Oh, no. Nothing further, Your Honor. Any follow-up questions by board members? Yeah, one question. Um, so, it, I, I'm just curious, your current employer is FedEx, right? Yes. And they wrote a letter of recommendation where they state, um, I'm trying to look for the letter right now, uh, where they state that... Uh, it's at A21. Um that they volunteered to write this letter and that um, I'm confident in her intelligence, work ethic, and skills, um, and that you're a valuable asset to the organization. Uh, they also say that you're dependable, dedicated, hardworking, and honest. In addition, exhibit two, you, um, your older daughter? Yes wrote a letter that talks about your character also. Yes. And I wanted to <coughs> ask you, um, these are very good characteristics to have. Um, did you, is this who you typically are or is this something that you've uh, been working towards such as, um, you know, work ethic, for example, um, skills. Uh, are you more organized now that you've been in FedEx? Or I, I just am trying to see what kind of worker you are and and your character. Yeah, I'm organized and I love my job. Anyway, I find myself. Uh, I do what I can do. Uh, to, to make my job to do it in a correct and follow the uh, correct procedure. 
Thank you. Any other questions by board members? Mr. McGee. I, I, I would ask that exhibit to be entered into evidence also. Exhibits, um, thank you. Exhibits two and three are admitted into evidence. And um, is, there, <coughs> is there anything else you would like to say before we conclude, Ms. Lawrence? Yeah. Um, like I say, I say I want board to uh, consider me for this check, to give me this check on chance to prove myself. I said I want board to give me a check on chance so I can prove myself that I'm a good nurse, I'm organized, I love to care. That is what I love to do. To be able to contribute to my community. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, matter is submitted and the record is closed. And we're off the record. Is Jennifer LaRue present? Please step forward. Hey, welcome, Ms. LaRue. Do you have any, um, you heard the advisements that I gave to the other, the other uh, people first thing this morning about focusing on rehabilitation? Yes, Your Honor. Do you have any questions about the uh, advisements that I gave? Your Honor. Okay. Do you have any documents in addition to the packet that you're going to want to introduce into evidence? Yes, I do. And do you have copies for all the board members? Yes, I've provided them. And, and I'll hand them out right now, Your Honor. Thank you. Do you have any other witnesses other than yourself? No, sir. Okay, hey, so uh, Mr. McGee has distributed a packet, a uh, stapled packet um, provided by Ms. LaRue. I have marked it as uh, exhibit number two. <coughs> and Mr. McGee, would you like to introduce this matter, please? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, again, I'm Daniel McGee, Deputy Attorney General, and I am appearing on behalf of the Attorney General pursuant to Government Code Section 11522, representing the people of the state of California. I am here to assist the panel in fact-finding. My role is not adversarial, but is intended to protect the public interest. I am here to ensure that the panel has adequate information from which to make a decision. 
And at this time, I would like to go over the petition packet and mark it for identification and offer it into evidence as Exhibit 1. Um, and the board members and petitioner have each been provided with a identical copy of the same set of this exhibit. So Exhibit 1 in this case generally consists of the cover page and summary of the license matter, a table of contents, at Section A, the petitioner probation report by probation monitor Savannah Coop, dated October 13th, 2017. At Section B, we have petitioner's petition for early termination and supporting documents, generally consisting of the petition dated May 29th, 2017. Nine letters of support recommendation, each of which are dated May 2017. Eight of these letters are by supervisors and co-workers. And the ninth letter is by Dennis Redding, attesting to respondents AA attendance, Alcoholics Anonymous attendance. Next, we have various transcripts and certificates demonstrating completion of some 39.25 hours in communication, con continuing education for the period of 2016 to 2017. Also included are petitioner's probation education course certificates demonstrating completion of 32 hours in substance abuse through Western schools and 30 hours in the nurse's legal advisor course through Homestead schools and also an employee performance review dated July 1st, 2016. At Section C, we have the Certification for Vocational Nurse License number VN226041. At Section D is the notice for this hearing and related correspondence. At Section E, is petitioner's quarterly probation reports and work performance evaluations. At section F is petitioner's probation education course certificates and I previously referenced those, so these are duplicates. At section G, we have support group attendance verification forms for the period of November 17th, 2014 through September 25th, 2017. Uh, at Section H, we have correspondence and like documents evidencing communications between the petitioner and uh, probation monitor Savannah Coop. And these documents also include orders of dismissal entered pursuant to Penal Code Section 1203.4 and form criminal matters, each of which are entitled People v. LaRue, and these are uh, Humboldt County Superior Court case numbers CR0030035, CR0324515, CR0234075, and CR1202114. And finally, at Section I, we have the board's underlying October 15th, 2014 decision. And at this time, I would offer into evidence this packet as Exhibit 1. Exhibit 1 is admitted into evidence. Thank you, Your Honor. And at this time, I'll provide a brief uh, summary of petitioner's license history with the board. On February 3rd, 2007, the board issued vocational nurse license number VN226041 to petitioner. The license is set to expire on July 31st, 2018. On June 13th, 2013, the board filed accusation number VN-2011-4405 against petitioner. The accusation alleged five causes for discipline for one, unprofessional conduct, two, substantially related conviction, three, conviction of crime involving alcohol, four, dangerous use of alcohol, 
and five, violating the terms of the vocational nurse license chapter. The accusation arose from a June 2012 conviction for misdemeanor driving under the influence entered against petitioner by the Humboldt County Superior Court. That conviction came with the special allegations of driving impaired with a minor passenger under the age of 14 and high blood alcohol conduct. Con content, excuse me. As matters in aggravation, the accusation also alleged that during the period of 1999 to 2003, petitioner had been convicted on three separate occasions for making a false report of a crime, a misdemeanor, and also a crime that involved the use of alcohol. Also, a conviction for disorderly conduct involving alcohol intoxication. This was a misdemeanor. And finally, obtaining welfare by fraud. In May 2014, petitioner entered into a stipulated settlement. In so doing, she admitted the truth of each and every charge contained in accusation number VN-2011-4405. The stipulation provided for the revocation of license stayed on four years probation pursuant to standard terms 1 through 14 and the following optional terms, additional terms, addictive behavior support group, abstinence from controlled substances, abstinence from alcohol, biological fluid testing, positive drug test, and major and minor violations. Further, respondent agreed to pay costs in the amount of $2,400, which she has been doing on a payment plan calling for payment of $65 per month. It may be noted now that at, at the present, a balance of approximately $645 remains outstanding. On October 15, 2014, the board adopted the stipulation as its disciplinary order, and the decision became effective on November 14, 2014. Petitioner is now petitioning for the early termination of her probation, asserting that she has complied with the terms and conditions of her probation. She also asserts that the terms of her probation present a major financial hardship for her family. However, in Petitioner's Probation Report at Section A, uh, Probation Monitor Savannah Coop suggests that Petitioner has not fully complied, um, and specifically, it appears that Petitioner failed to fully comply with Term 18, requiring Petitioner to submit to drug testing. In this regard, it appears that Petitioner failed to submit a biological fluid sample on April 1, 2017 nor has petitioner explained her failure in this regard. These circumstances were deemed to be a major violation and violation of Term 20. Uh, additionally, it appears that petitioner failed to call in and or log into the FAMATEC system on some 324 separate occasions. And finally, it also appears that petitioner failed to keep the board abreast of all address changes, a violation of term four. Um, my understanding is petitioner is ready to address these circumstances today. And because the burden is on petitioner, I have no further statements, but reserve the right to ask questions. Okay, Ms. LaRue, now is your time to present um, uh, what you have to say, and I ask you to stand and raise your right hand, and I'll get you sworn in. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Uh, please be seated, and let us know what you have to say. My name is Jennifer LaRue. I am an LVN, a Director of Staff Development, and an Infection Preventionist. I work at Eureka Rehabilitation and Wellness Center in Eureka, California. Um, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to come before you um, with my early termination request, and I would like to publicly apologize for the behavior that brought me here today. So over the last um, years since I've been on probation, um, I have abstained from all alcohol. 
Approximately, I believe the date of my DUI was on April, or April 21st of 2012. So that would bring me to not having a drink in five years and eight months. I do continue um, two AA meetings a month, which is required from the board. I uh, exercise regularly. Um, I've actually lost seven pounds or 70 pounds um, in my exercise program. I um, am enrolled in College of the Redwoods in Eureka to get some more of my prerequisites out of the way for the RN program. I continue to um, do my continuing education units um, through work and other sources. I am active in church. I've had some pastoral counseling um, with the pastor. Volunteer work. Um, I would say that I do a lot of volunteer work. I volunteer at my daughter's school um, through the community. Um, I've only done this a few times. It's something that I've just started. Uh, we have a Heart to Serve program where we take residents um, from our facility and go out and feed the homeless. Um, you may have heard about the Heart to Serve program. Um, I've done some volunteering work at the local theater uptown. I try to, to stay really active with the community. Um, I play golf when weather permits. Uh, I've just set some really goals for myself, working on my recovery, and have, have fulfilled. And thank you. Mr. Sellers, any questions? Just, you just stated that um, you attend a two times a month? I do. And you said because uh, it's required by the board? It was required by the board, yes. So if you were no longer required by the board, would you continue to, to attend? Probably. Why? Um, it's We've um, become really close. We have a really small town, and um, the group is, is we're really tight, and um, we just share a lot of life experiences. And it's a, it's a, it's a support system for myself. Um, I, I was just handed this packet, uh, Exhibit 1, so I've had a chance to look at it briefly. Um, can you address the 324 missed logins? My understanding when I went to my intake appointment with enforcement analyst on January 21st, um, of, I believe I put 2015 on there. And we had talked about the terms and agreements of biological fluid testing. And my understanding was that I was to call in daily when testing was available. And I have done that. It wasn't until I received this packet that I saw that I hadn't submitted or I mean I hadn't called in for 324 days. And um, it took me by surprise. And there was also a couple other things we might we might get to that took me by surprise. Had I known and had it been communicated clearly between uh, enforcement analyst and I, I would have called every single weekend. We don't have weekend testings where we're at. Um, so it's not something, I mean, I just, that was my understanding when we left my meeting was that I was to call in daily w with testing um, on the weekdays. So, so the 324 days are, are weekends for three plus years of time. That's what I understand now. I, it I just so happened that um, on April 1st, the day that I missed, that was on a, a Saturday, and that's why that was missed. I have no further questions at this time. Dearly. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, um, Ms. LaRue. Uh, in your petition uh, paperwork at B2, 
There's a section there called employment status. Yes. And I'm looking at uh, one of your notations in the first section there, 123115. Uh, you were terminated from work because you used profanity. Yes, I did. I did not use it in front of residents. I used it in my office, and I had a wax worker in there um, who took offense to it. I'd had a really stressful day, and I was just venting to myself in my office. Um, and she had let the administrator know that it had offended her, and because of uh, me not thinking before I spoke, it resulted in termination. Okay, the reason I'm asking that is under the employment history section, you give the dates of employment. So what position was that that you were terminated from? Is it listed here? Um, it was the director of staff development. I've worked with the same company for seven years, even though I was terminated at that particular building for my language. Um, and I've always worked as a staff development in the buildings. Oh, okay, so that was Seaview, right? No, that was Pacific. Okay, where's that listed? Am I missing that here? Well, no, actually, it doesn't look like on the top of there that it has employment history. Um, let's see. Is it at number three on page B2? No, actually, it's, it's not listed on there at all, but that's um, when it happened was at Pacific. I mean, yes. Is there some I, reason you failed to list Pacific? No, there wasn't a spot on here it looks like as to the question was while on probation have you been disciplined by an employer? So I was working there possibly or just I don't know. I didn't ask for the name of the organization and that's probably why I didn't put it on there. But that was part of your employment history? Yes, sir. And in the section called employment history, list all employers for the past seven years. Use additional paper if necessary. So was that a negligent oversight then? Yes, sir. What kind of work environment was Pacific? What kind of facility? Is it a facility? Yes, a long-term care facility and rehabil re rehabilitation facility. And what was your uh, title there? Director of Staff Development. And the board was aware that I was employed there during this time. I was actually employed there when I, I received my DUI. No, actually, sorry, that was at Seaview. And then in April of 2016, um, there was a mutual departure termination because you were not a good fit there. Is yeah. that right? Yes, at Open Door Clinic. And what kind of a facility is that? That is a family practice. Family practice? Like a community health center family practice. And you worked as a staff LVN there? I did, yes. That's all I have, Your Honor. Thank you. Ms. Amazola? Hi, um, uh, my question is, well, you're seeking early termination of probation, right? Yes. And it seems like there's been um, some communication problems with the testing, um, and then there's also some employment difficulties. As a board, um, 
it's difficult for us to try to um, overlook these things when making when um, when making a decision. Can you explain to us why we should um, do this? Or I, I just did you repeat the first part of that question? So I I guess my question is. I'm trying to understand if you're in probation and there's been some um, uh, problems in the probation. And, and I understand there was a communication, the facility was closed on the weekend, uh, and that you didn't understand. It's still your responsibility, right, to, to know what are your probation terms. And also you, you've you been, um, uh, it as was discussed earlier about your employment. There was two actions that look poorly on your employment record. Um, how, why should we grant you what this petition, given that there's two things during probation that have that look negative upon you? Well, for the first instance, with me using profanity, um, I've really worked on making sure that I don't react before I think about um, what's really going on. I, I give myself time to think about the situation. Um, overreacting doesn't solve anything. So I really worked hard on that with myself and and I'm calm and um, I just don't have those reactions. As far as the open door clinic goes, that was a mutual um, let go. It just was not a good fit for me. I don't think it had anything to do um, with with personalities or behavior on my part. It just wasn't what my heart was into, and it just wasn't working for me. And um, Thank you. Ms. Baste Martinez. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I need, want to follow up on the why you believe we should um, grant you early termination. Um, I'm looking at your paperwork and um, under the statement response of why should the Board grant your petition for early termination. I'm reading through part of your response and it says, uh, I feel I've paid my dues between testing and fines that continue to be a financial hardship for me. Um, granted, it is costly. We, we do understand that. Uh, but when you say you've paid your dues, what do you mean by that? I don't know that that was a great word to use in, in this. I feel that I have grown in my, my person, uh, myself. I feel that I have um, complied with my terms of condition. I've um, committed myself to my family, my community, my job. I've done all that's asked of me. I haven't drank since 2012. I just feel like that I've proven to myself and hopefully the board that probation is no longer needed for me. I need to move on and um, I'm going to school now and the the stiff restrictions that I have on my probation prohibits me from traveling with my daughter for like her tournaments because I have to give notice um, when I have to leave town. So I'm not able to do those things with her. It kind of holds me back on being able to further my um education as far as being committed to to the testing and um, three times a month 
there's a lot of um, continuing education that I would like to, to do, but I'm not able to sign up for it because if it's an all day um, conference, then I can't just leave to, to go test. Um, it's expected of me and not just expected, but I want to further my education and I really look forward to going to the conferences and the extra trainings that they have. And it, it it's really hard to, to fit all that in with the drug testing. I just, I've tried really hard to, to prove that I'm ready to, to go further and do other things. When you say go forth and do other things, assuming you were granted, can you translate to us how, from a planful perspective, what you would do, what that means? You've written some things here, but translate that. For okay, us. so I'd have more flexibility with, with my schedule. Um, for continuing my education with college, um, some I could I could work my schedule around my classes more. Um, there's some morning classes that I like to take next semester, and I wouldn't be able to do that with with the amount of drug testing that I have to do um, because my class is from like eight to twelve, and um, I know one of my classes is on Friday, and they don't do drug testing after noon on Friday, so. I wouldn't be able to do that Friday, Friday class. And what other thing do you see based on, you said you've learned your lesson or you've learned, you've grown, I, yeah. what the effect of the act of, of the circumstance, the incident that occurred, what effect, impact that has on the profession? And what is that? Well, it's very unprofessional to um, get a DUI. And um, I made a poor decision. I have a lot more integrity for myself than being that person. And I um, am I'm proud of that. I think it's important in a professional um, situation and my position in uh, where I work that I uphold that professional conduct and I set an example for others. Um, people look up to me. And that's important to me. They learn from me. That's important to me. I want to be that, that honest person, reliable, um, good work ethic. I want to do that for my children and my grandchildren. Um, and just be a, a productive person in the community and in my job. So that means doing it 100% of the time, all of the time, because... I, we can't help but see one of the reasons you were removed from a position was, and as you said, you acted too quickly or you didn't consider who was in the room. That is true. So you're practicing as an LVN. You've had a hard day. It's not gone well. What could we expect? expect me to to be professional I, I what would that look have, like um soft-spoken um calm presenting myself in a professional manner um listening um thinking and we have sometimes patients um and I'm a public member but I understand there are patients who can be very difficult because they are very, very sick and can be very demanding to the point sometimes it's frustrating. I don't get frustrated by my residents and their their needs and their disease processes and their cognitive impairment. 
that doesn't affect me. I um, I'm there to help them. I'm there to serve them. If it wasn't for the residents, I wouldn't have you know the lifestyle that I have. They provide that for me. I give them the utmost respect, and that's that's the person I am. And they would never see uh, me act unprofessionally to them. Thank you. Okay. Is Endoso? No questions. Is James Perez? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, so I'm looking at your packet here, and um, your response that you gave us today. Um, again, you know, it's 324 days yes. that show no logins, no call-ins. And from your um, testimony, it sounds like those were all weekends and holidays. They were all weekends. I even called in on the weekday holidays knowing that I didn't have to test, but it was still a weekday. The weekends, basically. Weekends, basically. I didn't know any of this until I got this packet last week. And I'm sure you can maybe see how that's also could be argued that that looks suspicious because yes. one of the most common times to consume alcohol is the weekends. Since you've been on probation with this board, have you consumed any alcohol? Absolutely not. Not since 2012, and I didn't get put on probation until 2014. So as soon as I got my DUI, the risks outweigh the benefits of drinking. Yeah. Um, and then you, you said, I, I was never specifically informed that I was to call seven days a week. Um, that's what you put here in this packet. Um, in the um, materials that we received, there is on page H. H16, a summary report of the probation meeting you had with Ms. Coop, but also on I, I is in Isaac, number 11, is actually a copy of the stipulated settlement that you signed and your attorney also signed. And on page I11, it says very specifically daily um, uh, that, you're, that you are, um, the expectation was for daily. As directed by the board. Mm -hmm. And my understanding was when I talked to Savannah that it was for for daily testing that they were open. We didn't discuss weekends. So did some, Did she specifically tell you Monday through Friday? She said on testing days. Um, so our, our clinic is not that we don't they don't do weekends in the three hundred forty two days. Um, is I'll strike that. The, there's one testing location. I'm trying to understand. There's yes, one testing there's one location. testing location, and it's in Eureka, and it's open Monday through Friday. Friday um, is a short day for testing, and then they have the normal holidays off as well. And then if that testing office were closed, where would you – is there another city near you that you would go to? No. Where's the closest place that you would go to? Um, you know, I, I don't actually know. That's where I'm set up to do it. Um, they've never offered me an alternative. I know that um, if I was to get permission to go out of town that I would be required to, to call as well. And then I know that you can go online and look for other testing sites. Um, and then the um, it was also a question about your address and uh, certain letters and clarifying that. And in your response, you say, that um, where you live, um, there's no mail to your house. Yes, your so, physical address. So I didn't know that I didn't that I was supposed to test on April first for the first reason is I that I had a test on the first. The first reason being I didn't call in because it was a weekend. The second was is until I got this, I wasn't aware of that. Apparently, they had sent me um, a letter asking for why it was that I didn't test. They sent it to my physical address, not my address of record. And so I never received that. And then apparently I just read the other day that they had also um, did a major violation on me. And I did not receive any correspondence um, with that either because they sent it to my physical address, um, which is, like I said, not my address of record. I've never received any um, correspondence from the nursing board to my home address ever. Um, so the question um, to me was, why did I get something sent to my home address when that's not my record? I didn't, um, I, on my quarterly reports, I did put that this was not a change of address because it was not a change of address. Um, 
it's blacked out here and I, I do have copies at home um, that I didn't have a chance to go through. There is a, a possibility that I put my street address on there um, when I was filling out my quarterly report, but that shouldn't have any bearing as to what my, my on record mailing address was. So this was a surprise to me, so that's why I, I wrote this. Um, and it seems like um, in your response it says the post office in Ferndale Yes, that's the city you live. Yes, we have I think like five hundred people in Ferndale. Uh, post office in Ferndale does not deliver mail to residents within the city, so there's no mail that can be delivered to your physical address. Is what you're saying? Absolutely not. I can't even order anything on Amazon. Um. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Turner. Thank you. Good afternoon. Could you verify with me your date of sobriety? I believe it was April 21st was my uh, day of my DUI in 2012. Oh, so you're saying that your date of sobriety was on the date of your arrest? Yes, I did not drink after that. I have not. Would you explain to us, once we board and you entered into a stipulated settlement of the charges that were brought against you. That's you understand that that was an agreement and we bypassed a lot of other hearings that we could have had to find out more about the situation. Why should this board terminate the probation early after we had an agreement with you for a certain period of time? I believe that I, I am eligible um, to have a hearing to ask for early dismissal. Um, personally, um, one of the reasons that, that I pursued it in requesting for early termination um, was that it has caused some problems in me in, in advancing at my work. Um, and I explained those to you guys uh, about my conferences and my continuing education. Um, it restricts me from traveling um, without, you know, prior notice, and um, I'm not allowed to go to a lot of my daughter's sports events um, because they're out of town, even though it's like an hour and a half away, it's still out of the county, um, and sometimes I don't always know that she has games 10 days prior to get approval for that. It's becoming more increasingly more difficult for me um, to afford. Um, I'm trying to save um, for college funds for my daughter, um, who has high expectations of herself. I'm enrolling in school, and the tuition costs um, are very expensive. My quality of life, um, I've always accepted what I've done um, and because that's just the person I am. I'm, I, I hold myself accountable for my actions, absolutely. But the quality of life, I want to, you know, I have psoriasis really bad and I'm not allowed to take the medication that they prescribe me because it has alcohol in it and so I'm just afraid that, you know, it might come up. Health supplements, you know, I'm really into being healthy and I'm not allowed to take those. I'd love to have a poppy seed muffin. And so I don't, you know, those are things that I have to go without. So that's why I requested for early termination. I want to be free from the strict, the stiff restrictions. And I think that, that I've showed the board and nursing that that I'm not at risk putting myself or anybody in harm's way. So no drinking since April 20. 2012, yes. Ms. Carpenter. Yes, thank you for the additional documentation. That did answer some of the questions that I had. And I am familiar with Ferndale. 
You, are you still attending AA meetings twice a month? Yes. Do you have a sponsor? No, I do not have a sponsor. Um, do you have a reason you don't have a sponsor? Excuse me? Do you have a reason you don't have a sponsor? Um, no, our group is just really close, and we just we share a lot of life experiences, and we talk a lot, and we're just a really big support system. I have a huge support system with my family and with church and in the community that... And before I started to go into AA, you know, I was already into to not having an alcoholic beverage for for over two years before I was asked to go to AA. Um, so I've just gone and um, to to have that support there. I don't I don't have the urge to drink. Um, I don't have things that make me want to drink. Um, drinking is, is not who I am, and I've been that way since 2012. Um, it, it doesn't even enter my mind to have a drink. Um, so that's why I've, I've just never got a sponsor. You know, a lot of these, and I know we talked about a few before I became a nurse. Um, one of the couple of things that we discussed were prior to me becoming a nurse, and the board had okayed that for me. Um, but they're pretty much isolated incidences, and I just, I never felt the need for a sponsor. Okay, thank you. I've never relapsed, um, you know, it wasn't an everyday thing that I did. Thanks. Is, do the board members have questions? Any follow-ups? Tellers. Your Honor, I have two quick follow-ups. Um, based on what she said, do you do you work the steps? Have you ever worked the steps of A? No, I mean, in my everyday life, um, I make it a point not to to hurt people's feelings and um, to be respectful and to treat others like I want to be treated. Um, you know, give everybody the utmost respect that they deserve and treat others how I want to be treated. Um, so, you know, I use some of the principles of AA in, in my everyday life and with my growth. And uh, You work in recovery. You don't see any need for any type of structured recovery program for yourself? No, I don't. I actually, um, it was one of the, in the statements that I provided for you, one of the uh, requirements for getting my drug um, testing reduced was that I had two assessments from alcohol and other drug program um, to see if I met the criteria for treatment. And the both times that I went in there, I did not meet the criteria for treatment. Um, I provided um, the enforcement analyst with copies of those. My understanding was that on January 21st of 2050, at our initial assessment, I had brought her a um, alcohol and um, drug assessment and provided that to her. She said that under condition five, if I had completed another one, that my drug testing would be reduced to two times a month. That never happened. Um, although I provided her the documentation, I believe it is written in here. Well, I know it's written in here on one of the attachments. Um, do you know what section our, our initial meeting was in? What section are? I, I wasn't. I wasn't suggesting it was necessary. Uh, just wondering if you thought it might be helpful for yourself. Um, I, I guess I'm picturing you with the the small group of, of men and women that you uh, go to AA with, and I assume they're probably working steps. I just wondered if you too chose to work steps. Um, my other question is: you have a number of references in here. Only one that specifically refers to to uh, your recovery, a very short one. None of them mention any knowledge uh, by them that you're you've had this entanglement. Do they know? Do do these people who give you references are they aware of your situation? Absolutely. Yeah, that's. Um, I don't ever keep it a secret as to me getting a DUI. I um, actually advocate for not drinking and driving and encourage people and teach people that it's it's not it's not 
a good thing to do. So yes, all, all my uh, acquaintances at work and friends at work and bosses, they are aware. The references, all the references. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Actually, I, I'm just uh, reading over the history and I, I've heard you say several times um, the DUI I had, the DUI I had, referring to that one incident. Um, there were some complicating factors, though, with the DUI. Your daughter was in the car, right? Yes, she was in the car. How old was she at the time? Um, 13 now. Seven or eight. And yeah. I think in the front seat, no booster seat. There was something like that. Was she in the back or the front? She was in the back. Okay, but no booster seat. Yeah. Right? Um, and I'm sure you can see how that's endangers. That endangers both your lives. Absolutely. Um, before that, also in 2012, there was an arrest for disorderly conduct and alcohol intoxication. Um, in 2003, there was a disorderly conduct and alcohol intoxication. In 2002, there was a filing a false re police report. And the circumstances I read, um, <coughs> it seemed that you were also intoxicated at that time. Yes. And actually... Um, a le uh, accused a police police officer of raping you. Um, that was the false police report. Um, so it seems like there's been some alcohol problems that have gone back quite a few years. Yes. Um, it wasn't just one DUI. Would you consider yourself an alcoholic? No. Um, do you think that you have or have ever had a problem with alcohol? Possibly, yes. Thank yeah. you. Any follow-up questions? Mr. McGee. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, ha have you ever heard the expression that if you're in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, you're probably an alcoholic? Yes, I have. And I just, I, I didn't hear the response that you just gave to uh, Ms. James Perez's question. Did you say that, um, do, do you acknowledge having a problem with alcohol, a current problem? No, I do not have a current problem. I haven't drank since 2012. Okay, and um, do, you, do you believe you had a problem with alcohol before that time, before 2012? And I believe you said your sobriety date was April 20th, 2012? Yes, I did. I did have some problems with drinking. Okay, and do you, do you feel that you've somehow been cured in recovery? I think that I've learned that nothing good comes out of drinking alcohol and decided um, that that's not the person that I want to be is an alcoholic. And, and you've been attending two AA meetings per month, is that correct? That's correct. And this is what was required by the board in terms of your probation? It was. Did you have opportunity to attend more than two meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous per month? If you so chose to? If I so chose to, yes, I would be able to attend. How many times, if, if you know, how many times uh, per week do they offer AA meetings in the Ferndale area? Four times a month. Four times per month? And uh, towards the beginning of the questioning, Mr. Sellers asked um, if probation was to be terminated on your behalf, uh, would you continue to attend AA meetings? And my question for you is, if probation were to be terminated, would you want to continue to attend AA meetings? Yes, I've become really close with the people um, that go to the meetings. And since the date of your license being revoked until today, have you been convicted of any crimes? No. Okay, and my understanding of the underlying DUI arrest, uh, if I recall correctly, um, when you were arrested, your daughter was found to be unrestrained in the front seat of the vehicle. Is that somehow wrong? No, I believe it was in the back seat, but if the report says that it was in the front seat, then, then that's where it was at. She did have a seat belt on. She just wasn't in her booster seat. I don't know, um, you know, yeah. 
And, and in terms of your attendance at uh, AA, are you in any service with respect to that group? I do not do a lot of service stuff through AA. I um, I have, I have a very busy life, as we all do, and I try to um, continue my focus on my education, um, my job, my family, and becoming a better person which I have, and moving on. Okay, and um, when you were responding to questions regarding why you would want to see the early termination of your probation, you said, for example, I can't eat a puppy or a, a poppy seed muffin, right? Um, let me ask you this. If your probation is terminated and you have the urge to drink, what are you going to do? What do you have in place in terms of a support group? I don't believe that I will have the urge to drink. I haven't had the urge to drink since I've had my DUI. Um, perhaps in the future if I did have the urge, I mean, I have AA, I have my family, I have my church, I have my pastoral counseling um, is available to me with my pastor. I have my support group at work. Okay, so you would call somebody? Is that what you're suggesting if you do have the urge to drink? Well, absolutely. Okay, but you don't believe you will have the urge to drink? No. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Any follow-up questions by board members? Thank you very much. Is there anything else you would like to say before we conclude? No, just thank you for the opportunity um, in listening. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Then... Um, the exhibits are admitted, exhibits um, one and two, and the record is, uh, the, the matter is submitted, the record is closed, and we're off the record in this matter. We'll take a, a, five, a five or ten minute recess at this point.